chapter G, apertures, and beautiful calculation of the depth of field, concept of depth of field in photography. And that's going to be our main uh, calculation that's going to take some time, but it's going to be all algebra and reinforcing the formulas of lenses, the lens formula, uh, the simple formula uh, for object and image distance for a lens, but we're going to use it more than once because for the depth of field, there's a far point and a near point that's in tolerable focus. And then there's some point between the two that you're actually focused on and we need to uh, work with three pairs of object and image distances. You'll see all this worked out. And become an expert in the mathematics and physics of photography. Okay, chapter G. Now, if you wanted one word for G, uh, we could use aperture. Or you could say F number, the opening in the camera. You say aperture. And the first thing we'll look at is the pinhole camera. And this goes back many, many years, thousands of years, over th thousands of years, a couple thousand years easily, where it was observed that, like if you had a room, for example, and there was an opening, that the light would pass through. Now they didn't understand all this diagram stuff back in those days, but they, they observed this where you would see an upside down image on the wall. Now, now here the room size relative to this distance, a tree or something, this would be farther away and this would be smaller. But this is the general idea. In this video, we demonstrate how to make a room size camera obscura, which is an exciting project for students of all ages. This ray diagram shows how the image in a camera obscura is upside down. Left and right are also reversed as seen here. We will turn this business office into a camera obscura. We are in downtown Asheville, North Carolina, USA. Note the majestic mountains in the distance. Our nice window view will be displayed on the wall as well as on part of the ceiling because we are on an upper floor. And once we cover the windows and make a small hole, we will be able to see all the hustle and bustle outside projected on this wall upside down. This is the black plastic that we're going to be using to cover the room. You can get it at any hardware store. Uh, it's black plastic sheeting. Use a knife to cut a hole in the sheeting. It is easier if you first trace a circle using a round object. So this is the size that I cut for the brightest point of the day. It's two centimeters, which is the size of a US penny, which is what I used to trace. Um, as the day goes on and we have less light, around three o'clock I found that a hole more like this size would work. And uh, at five or six, a hole about this big will still let enough light through to see the image. Cover all windows with black sheeting. Then turn off all room lights and check for light leakage. You may need to use extra tape or apply more than one layer of sheeting to fully block out the light. Windows without blinds will most likely need more than one layer. Here is our room after converting it to a camera obscura. Once we turn the room lights off, the enchanting image will appear. Our inverted city scene can be seen on two walls and the ceiling. This still is a 30 second exposure taken with a Nikon D90 digital camera. We were charmed by the moving images produced by our camera obscura. This video is of the ceiling where we could easily see the tops of the cars as well as the road below. We also saw motion on the walls. When making your own camera obscura, if possible, pick a place where there's interesting outside activity 
so that you may also view motion. So this is the concept of the pinhole camera, where you make a small hole and then you can get a picture. They, they had like oatmeal boxes when I was a kid where you, you could then make a hole and put film back here. We didn't have digital sensors back in those days. And we'll use the word film a lot in our course, but you can always replace film with a digital uh, sensor, uh, with a digital camera idea. The physics basically, ideas are basically the same in terms of the optics. So here, if the hole is bigger so that you can get more light in, then the problem is you don't have this one-to-one -one correspondence of object points and image points. See that? point from the top can go here, point from the top can go there, point from the top can go there, and this is a blur. The light is spread out. So a drawback of pinhole cameras is that you have to expose things for a long time, like maybe a whole minute, have the person stay still. It's good for a landscape, but it's hard to take a picture of a person. Now, if you go too small, you get diffraction uh, let's look at diffraction and blow things up. If you have here two barges and these are waterways coming in like this, then the water will start to spread out. And the secret here is when the wavelength of the wave is comparable to the size of the opening, say this is D, then this will happen. So if you make the hole too small, you then get the fraction. Now there's a cool little thing with a slit that I saw first in high school. I'd like to do it for you. It's a neat little idea where if you have an opening that you pair off one point with say the middle point and then the point really next to it goes to the point below it. And what you do is you draw this little triangle and you're looking at going to a screen far away over here is a screen say distance L away and uh, we'll make the approximation is pretty much along the axis so that L will also be the distance. This is basically the distance you know, to the screen. But this little triangle in here, uh, when, when a crest leaves the top to go off to the screen and say a trough is leaving the bottom in order to cancel and you'll have darkness here and you'll have then in the blur, you'll sort of have like, you know, a blur uh, here. And this is sort of a guide that people use to like set the uh, limit of the diameter. So you don't want to be smaller, say, than a relationship that, you know, relates this minimum, this first minimum. And then as you go uh, other places, you get, you know, you get more bright and, you know, dark regions. But this is the basic idea. This is the optical path difference delta. Uh, this is d over 2. And if you look at this angle that you're looking up toward the screen, uh, if you look at this triangle, this is the same angle as the one inside. So in other words, this angle here is theta. This angle uh, will be, oh, not that one. Uh, th that's phi, say. Uh, the one up here. The one up here, theta this angle up here. So you got phi. In other words, this angle is complementary to phi. We can go ahead and make it a little bit bigger. We can make it a little bit larger. Then you can see that the theta is complementary to the phi. But since this is a 90 degree angle, then this angle here is also theta. So it's this, say d over two times a sine of theta which gets you that delta. So if there's a, a crest leaves here, and this delta is, say, half a wavelength, where a, a valley leaves, uh, then you're gonna get cancellation. So d over two sine of theta, uh, you want that to be equal to lambda over two to get this minimum, which gives you a cute formula, d sine of theta uh, equal to lambda. But, you know, the sine of theta, if this is the width on the screen over two, then uh, the sine of the angle 
theta is approximately theta, is approximately the tangent of theta. So you can write down here w over 2l. And they're all pretty much l if you're far away and you're close to the uh, optic axis. So that means here you get d uh, w uh, over 2l is equal to lambda. And that gets you a formula uh, here, d would be 2, uh, let's see, a 2 uh, la lambda l over w. Now if we look at our pinhole again, like the camera, say, then you're gonna have here a little triangle and a big triangle, and say this is W and this is D, the diameter. This is the distance the object is away from the camera. This is the focal length because here, nothing really gets focused uh, with the pinhole camera. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but we will call this the focal length since that's what we do when we have a regular camera and we have to take pictures of things far away, uh, the distance is the focal length away. So here you could just set up a little relationship that if you have, say, D divided by S would be a W divided by S uh, plus F. And here the S is going to be very, very large, very, very, very far away. So that means you basically have, you know, D is going to be equal to the W. When you take this far away, the D is going to match the W. So if we come down here and write down then D squared, because D times the W would be D squared, and the L is going to be the focal length, then you get this cool formula, D is the square root of two uh, lambda f. Now we did this for a slit, but if you do it for like a circle, an aperture that's circular, then you get something else. So there's like general formula, you could write down some k lambda f, where k depends on the slit or the, or the circle or opening you would get, for example, like a 2.44, but then there's other criterion you can think of. So there's no really one way to set up an, an equation for like the optimum diameter, but this is often used, and then they'll use this near the strongest uh, visual reaction to light in the yellow green by 50 nanometers. Here we have a set of 10 different insect pens from size triple aught to size seven. Uh, the size triple aught has a diameter of 250 microns, 300 microns, 350, et cetera. By 50 micron instruments, the biggest one is 700 microns, about seven tenths of a millimeter across. Compare that to the size of a human hair is typically around 80 microns across, so a third the size of the smallest pen. These insect pins are perfect for making pin holes for pinhole cameras. The first step that we need to do is to remove the lens from the camera. We won't need that lens anyway. And we're going to take a body cap and drill a large hole in the body cap that our small pinhole will fit in front of. So I'm wiggling the pin around to make the hole in the foil and you can feel it kind of punch through and now I have a nice clean hole in the foil. For the next step I'm just going to lift up the corner of this electrical tape easel that I've made and slide 
our pinhole foil underneath. Try to center the hole over the hole that you've drilled. And this black tape should help eliminate any light leaks. Here is a pinhole camera photo taken by co-author Gerson Morales of his girlfriend, Suzette. Due to the small size of a pinhole aperture, it is not unusual for the exposure to take a full minute. Blur can be present for human subjects since it is difficult to remain perfectly still for that long. The pinhole camera has infinite depth of field, meaning that objects far away like bricks as well as the close book are both in focus. Since those days, you've gotten married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if we want to look at the concept of F number, here's the problem. When you take a picture of something, all right, if you have a focal length, all right, and you know, you're very, very far away and you take a picture. So let's just make it like here. And you come in here, you go, you know, through the focal point, and then you come in here. You get yourself a, an image here. Now the problem is that if the focal length is large, like a telephoto lens, then you're not going to get much light hitting the film due to the like enlargement, like the telescopic effect. So if we come over here to a longer focal length, okay, we'll make it over here. And then if you come here through the through the center like this, you you, you can see that that here we're going to get a large spread out the same amount of light coming from the object so we're going to have trouble in other words you you're going to have to ha adjust the opening here to let in more light to make up for this All right so this would be if you look at for example this is the height of your uh, your image and if you Look at the height of you. Remember these formulas we had where we had like H uh, I over H object is S I over S O. We did stuff like that. Well, for a constant S O, like let's say S O is constant, right? In this case, then uh, you will find that you could write down that the height of the image is then proportional. Oh, uh, your, your spread out is going to, uh, based on the SI, and since you're far away, SI is going to be uh, the focal length. So basically, here, this is, these are not drawn to scale correctly because they're all going to be, you know, close to the focal point when you're far away. But this helps you see that the, the light gets spread out. So the light gets spread out. And you know the area, like if you have a, the rectangle or some kind of, you know, a square, you would have this in like two dimensions. The film is two dimensional. So the brightness, which we'll call the intensity, goes as one over uh, the area on the film. And that's going to go uh, as uh, one over F squared. So just imagine this height. You know, and the height is proportional to the SI, which is proportional to the, the focal length, because this is going to be very close to the focal point. So if you double the focal length, you get one half the light back here. That's the thing. So the area, though, of the opening, so say you have an opening in front of the, or the stop, let's say the opening here, then the area goes as d squared, all right, because, you know, the area is pi r squared and r is you know, D over two, and we, we basically don't care about the pi. We just want to know the, the proportion. So in other words, if you double a linear dimension, you're gonna like square it. So if you double the focal length, you need to double the, you need to double the, uh, the diameter. So you see here, uh, the, 
diameter uh, can compensate uh, for the F. So in other words, if D is proportional to F, if you set this up like this, then if you, uh, you know, double the F, you're gonna then have one fourth the amount of light that hits the film. But if you double the D, you'll have four times as much light hit the film and that will cancel. So that's the, that's the key. So it's defined in photography. This is a, a ratio, the ratio. So if you take the F and divide by the D, you want that to be a constant. You want it to be fixed. And we'll call that some magic number, the magic number. So that means if that number, say, is fixed, then to, to keep that equation true, if you double the F, you have to double the D, and that's what you want. So they'll write this as F over D equals the number. I like to write it like most uh, folks do. The D would be F divided by the number. So this is the diameter adjusted for uh, the focal length. Uh, so now it's kind of neat. You could say, uh, let's go F8. So that would be a, an opening, but that opening will, let's say, change actual size. The D will change based on the F. So you have a camera that has a telephoto lens. Uh, I have a wide angle. It doesn't matter. We just get the light meter out in the old days and say, hey, F8. Everyone sets it to F8, click, click, click. And the uh, cameras are designed, the lenses, so that the opening is whatever it has to be based on that focal length. So that's the basic idea. And one of my students uh, years ago told me about the art photography professor, Dan Milspa, who has retired, who gave a beautiful uh, picture way of seeing this, uh, teaching photography. For example, yeah, you have a, say you have a lens, put the lens, we'll just have to say a lens there, and that's the opening. But what he did is he said, if you had like, just make a circle and draw these circles, if you can draw like, like there's your opening, that's, that's the diameter of the circle. If you can put four of them there, he says you have F4. And then if you uh, say had a, a, a bigger one like this, where it say just two of them would fit, then at two diameters, you know, would fit in there then he would say you have F2. And if you look at this relationship, it kind of you know, makes sense that if you have here a D, and f now he didn't do the math, all right, he, he's finished. In other words, that's the explanation. That's the artistic way, beautiful way to just see what the F number is. But I wanna just show you the connection. Here you have one, two, three, four Ds, four Ds equal F, all right? Well, four Ds equal F, that means D, is F over four. So yes, that's the uh, F4 case. Then here, if two Ds equal F, then the D is F over two. So I'm now showing you why it works. Uh, this, this is a picture definition of this. It's basically saying that if you wanna know what the number is, you see how many Ds you can fit in F. And that's like, that's the definition. Like that's what we have here. So that's very, very neat to see that. So now we come to the, uh, the full stops. And the full stops are the F number sequence. And these are uh, considered complicated with the uh, photographers because they're not physics majors and, and they struggle with this. But the idea is if you wanna have your click, 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 click on the camera lens, change the area by two. So you double the bigger openings four times as much area. You know, you're going like this, click, click, click. Then the D goes as a square root of the area because the area is like pi r squared. You know, it's, it's, it's like D squared. So if you want like what the diameters would go to pull this off, so you go click, 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 the areas are doubling. You take the square root of one is one, the square root of two is 1.4, the square root of two, four is two, we can go to the this is an easy one, four, and eight, and uh, two, uh, say 56 would be what, 16. Then the square root of eight is between two and four, and you can use your calculator, it's 2.8, 
and then the screw root of 25 is 5, and 36 is 6, it's like between 5 and 6, well, more precisely, that's actually 5.6, and the square root of 128, well, I remember back in grade school, learning 11 times 11 is 121, so that's close. Um, that's how, this is the numbers that you use. These are, these are numbers printed on a camera, like you're gonna see this, like the F numbers. And here, a UNC student once taught me how to memorize the sequence. You start with one, and you start with 1.4, you memorize these two. Okay, if you memorize these two, then he says you skip double, you skip double, you skip double, and you skip double, and that works. Then if you go here and skip double, you get 2.8, and if you skip double, you get 5.6, and if you skip double, that's like 5.5, and you get to 11. And if you skip double, the next one's gonna be uh, F22. In fact, you can even go the other way. This is point, uh, seven, see, and then this would be a point 0.5. This is very powerful, all right? So that's kind of neat, see that. So there are the F numbers. Now just remember that when the number, the number is getting bigger, like this, just remember your definition, D is F over the number. So you're getting smaller opening. So the opening uh, gets, opening is smaller. So in other words, F22 is a smaller opening than F1. So just remember with these numbers, the bigger number means a smaller aperture. All right, that's neat. Now we're gonna to go to depth of field. See, technically with a camera and the physics of a camera, technically, only one distance gets you a sharp image. So if you come in like this uh, and you come here through the center, you have yourself this sharp image. If you move this to the left, this goes to the focal in the focal point direction. And it, you know, so if this is matched perfectly with the sensor here for perfect focus, then someone standing behind you technically is gonna be blurry. However, the human eye can tolerate some blurriness. So the depth of field would be, if you're focused on this person, maybe a few folks behind you, a few feet behind you, and up here, they're still in focus. So if they're all in focus, then we call this the depth of field. And the corresponding uh, distance here that would move with those objects, uh, this would be the depth of focus. All right, so we want to look at this idea, this depth of field, very, very powerful in photography. Notice that with the pinhole camera, if we look up here, it doesn't matter where you are, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with the object points and the image points, so everything's always in focus. And we say the pinhole camera has infinite depth of field. And look, it makes sense that here, we're gonna show you that these have better depth of field, the smaller openings, like the pinhole. And that's very easy to see by this diagram. If you have a lens and you have something far away, and let's say it focuses uh, here, and then you have something uh, close by, that will focus you know farther away over here now if you put the if you put the uh, screen here then this one that's far away is in perfect focus if you put the screen here this one's in perfect focus we say when you have this, these blurs these are called circles of confusion now, with respect to that far one, this one's, this one's fine, but there's a circle of confusion with respect to the other ones. They spread out. But if you want to try to get both in the best possible way, you would go with the screen here. So this would be looking at all the possibilities. That's the least circle of confusion. So that would be where you would shoot for to put 
to put your film for the best possible case. Now, it, it may be that you can tolerate this blur, but if you go any, separate them any more, then no, it would be, it would be too drastic because these points would, would start to move apart too much. So what you can think of, what you can think of is that, say, here's, here's the, the trick. If you're, if you're looking at, if you're looking at this, giving you something that you can tolerate, watch what happens if you were to block more rays. In other words, this has a stop. Let's say this opening's pretty big. But suppose you made it so that the opening was much smaller, all right? So let's see, if we, if we do that, what'll happen, I think you can already see it, it you, you will squeeze down the, the circle of confusion because you won't get those rays that are so far out. In, in other words, if the, if the biggest one you get is gonna be here, you see when you then head down to there, uh, this is not gonna be as large. Go ahead and do it here. So if we look at uh, the two here, we go there, we go there, let's say we go there, and then this one goes here. You can see that, see this, these circles of confusion are squished because you're squishing down the aperture. Uh, and if you do that, the, the rays are closer to the uh, axis and they're not gonna be as large. So this means that you have now gotten less than the circle of confusion there, which means now you can make these points spread out more and, and then they'll, Circle of confusion will get a little bit larger, but you can afford to do that. So that's kind of a neat way to see, to see the uh, the reason, uh, two reasons why when you go to a pinhole camera, you're going to get a, an infinite depth of field. So that's already a suggestion that when you move to smaller openings, things are going to get better for the depth of field. But also this argument that if you close down, or stop down, say your uh, aperture, then the rays hug the uh, axis more, and that means circle confusion is less, and now you can afford to separate your distances here to bring back a larger uh, circle of confusion. All right, so that's kind of cool to see all that, and the last thing we're gonna do is Algebra City and calculate the, uh, calculate the depth of field. We wanted to do one more neat thing here I wrote a paper on this, and this is the vanishing fence. Now for the vanishing fence, I was at a zoo, and I was trying to take a picture of an animal back here. So this, this the animal's far away. So let's say the animal would the head of the animal would be focused here, all right? But there was a fence, there was a fence close by. Now the fence, well, be between me and the animal, all right? Let's say that. So the fence, that would be focused uh, farther, you know, back here. Okay, so we have, we have the animal, is the blue, okay, and this would be uh, the fence. So the fence is the red one, and the animal, this is the animal back here. So the fence blocked the animal. So when I looked at the animal, I saw the fence blocking part of the face. Now, if we look at this, the circle of confusion, if you wanna get the fence and the animal, we put the we put the uh, film here, or the sensor here. But see, I don't want the fence at all, so I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna put the film, or focus, I'm gonna focus here so that the animal is in focus, and then the fence, all this red, has a circle of confusion. It's like washed out, you know, you're not gonna see it. A little degradation of the overall picture, but who cares uh, if you don't see the fence, that's good. But now watch the bonus. The bonus here, and this is really crazy, you cannot see the fence. But the camera lens was large enough so that a ray of light that went above the fence, 
because the fence, you know, had openings. So like, there's like, there's like, there's like a metal part of the fence here, maybe metal part of the fence there, but, but here there's like an opening. So that light could get focused. So the animal, I got the animal, like I got, I, I could see through the fence. Here's the animal. And the fence is spread out. So I was able to get a picture of the animal and make the fence disappear. We are at the Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium in Omaha, Nebraska, USA. There are two bongos beyond the fence. Bongos are large African antelopes that live in the forest. We would like to take a video of the bongos, but the fence is in the way. Note that part of the fence crosses the face of the right bongo and two other regions of the fence block part of the left bongo. If we zoom in on the bongos, the fence will become out of focus. Watch what happens. The fence vanishes. It's as if there is no fence between us and the bongos. Remember one part of the fence cross that bongo's face and other parts of the fence cross the body of the left bongo. There is no sign of the fence. Here comes a visitor crossing the path. We zoom out slightly, still no fence. A little bit more, still no fence, but now the fence starts to appear as a ghost. You can see parts of the fence, there we go, even more so and more so as we zoom out more and more. If we try the same trick with this bongo, it doesn't work since the fence is too close to the bongo. Now we go to G6, and these are the formulas, okay? Depth of field formulas. So here, for the depth of field formulas, we basically want, you know, a situation. Let's go ahead and make ourselves a little lens here. We've got something far away. It's going to hit here, say so wind up. Go there. All right. And let's look at something that is near, All right, like that. And that one's going to focus you know, somewhere back here, right, as predicted by the physics. And then what we'll do is look at the least center of confusion, which is here. That's the least blur. That's the least amount of blur. So let's put in some parameters here. This would be the distance of the object distance for the uh, near. And this one here would be the object distance for the far away object. And then we have on this side, okay, you, maybe we don't put all the arrows in because here it's gonna clutter the diagram. Here's this point there, that's gonna be the image of the near object, all right? And then I'm gonna have the image distance for the far object, all right? That really should be a subscript. OK, 
Okay, this is a D over two. This is D over two, because that's your aperture, your diameter. So this is far. And this here is near. All right, and the depth of field uh, here, the depth of field is gonna be from the near to the uh, far. This is the depth of field. Uh, depth, say, of field. And here, if you look at from this point to this point there, that's the depth of focus. Uh, this diagram is highly exaggerated. I mean, these distances are very far away, and uh, you can see the you can see the uh, picture uh, better. And then uh, we're going to look at one more point. This is what makes things a little complicated because we're gonna be focused somewhere here is where we're gonna focus if we wanna get both of these together. So uh, when we do that, see that is where you're gonna find the film is being placed. The film is being placed ideally for some point in between, but you can tolerate the blur. So. This point is exactly in focus, but the far and the close are within reasonable focus. So that brings us to one more thing. Okay, this is the object distance is where I'm focused on. And then this would be the image distance of the thing I'm focused on. So now you've got a lot of stuff. You've got like three pairs of S's. And then you have one more thing we have to add and that is the circle of confusion diameter. So let's say C is the diameter, C over two and C over two. And we wanna find what this is in terms of the S, O, and, you know, D and C and F, you know, we don't, we don't really want to have the near and far ones variables in the, in the elegant equation. So to start things off, we write down the equation. And this is a nice uh, chapter because it shows the power of physics. You know, photographers are not physicists and they'll struggle with the F numbers. And when it comes to this, they'll just look at the formula. I mean, they won't, won't, won't derive it. See, we're gonna be able to derive it because it's the power of a physicist. Mathematics is our language, and we know the equations that go with this. And here's the equation, it's a lens equation. And we'll have three of these equations, right? And, you know, the, these equations, uh, you know, you have, you have one for the, uh, you have one equation, you know, because you three pairs. You have your, your SO, your SOF, and your SON you know, for the one in the middle, not exactly in the middle, wherever, you don't know where it's gonna be, but it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. Uh, and the other two, so we have this one equation, and if we look at here, let's look at a triangle. If we look at this triangle, and look at, say, this angle, theta, and there's an angle theta in there, you can see that if you look at this angle theta and this triangle, this triangle has the SI, SI far and the D over two. So if I have SI far and I divide by D over two, so SI far is at the base of this like triangle and divide by here, say, then that would be taking this little distance, right? And divide by the C over two. So what is that little distance? That's SI minus SIF. SI minus SIF, it's that little piece. So you're looking at these two triangles, where if we were to make them, say, larger, this is a D over two, this is an SIF, and this here is C over two, and this is here, this S I 
which just go all the way here, and then minus the S I F. Uh, you can set the ratio up any way you want. If you like tangents, you can put this over that and that over. Uh, you'll get this. You'll get this thing flipped. So it's it's no big deal. Um, you just set that proportion with the two similar triangles. So this means that the S I F over D is S I minus S I F over C. And that would mean C times S I F equals D times S I F, excuse me, S I. I like to write the S I first, so I don't like to think it's like a, like a differential. And then uh, minus uh, here, uh, S I F, you know, with the D again, like this. And then we want to collect the S I, the S I F. So if we want to do that, the S I F will have a C plus a D from the other side. And that's going to be S I D. All right. And we come to a nice formula that the S image distance for the far object, say, is S I D over C plus D. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so then we can go back to this formula where we take this and put it in there. We can then put it in there. And then we're gonna solve for the far. We're gonna solve for the far object uh, distance. Cause see, I ultimately wanna take that and subtract it from the near one to find a depth of field. So if we do that, uh, things get a little messy here. So let's see what we got. We have one over S OF plus one over, and we put all this stuff in there. So this is SID over C plus D. That's one over F. And now we can flip this. C plus D over S I D. We just flipped what we're dividing by there. Fifth grade teacher, heat, change, multiplication, and invert. See? So here we then uh, can like work this out. Uh, if you want to work this out, it's like let's find the common denominator. This is O F. S I D, excuse me, S I D is capital, no, no subscript. Then this is S I D cancels, gets you the one over S O F, and then plus I need here the S. Uh, I need to cancel here the S uh, O F, and let's check. So this first one, the SID cancels, I get what I'm supposed to. Here, the SOS cancel, and I get what I'm supposed to. So at this point, we can write down, bring the F on the uh, left-hand side, F SID plus F SOF, like this, and C plus D, and then bring this on the right-hand side, That. Oops, this is just the, uh, this one here is just the SI. Okay, so we got it. Boom, boom, say SI and the D. And then what we can do uh, here is we can multiply all this stuff out. Okay. You gotta be careful here, this S stands for far, and that S stands for the focal length, so you gotta be careful of that. So focal length, S object far, D is then, just copy this down again like that. And now it's time to get the S O S all by themselves on one side of the equation. So it looks like I got one here, one there, and I got one there. So that would mean I would have F, 
SOFC plus this one, FSOFD minus this one to bring it on the other side. And then this goes on the right side with the minus sign. Now I can factor out the SOF, FC plus FD minus SID equals minus FSID. So then S OF is minus S FSID over the FC plus FD minus SID. Well, don't like this. We don't want that in there. 1SO plus 1 over SI is 1 over F. Yep, that's what you got to do. Now, you know, when you have this, two of these like this, you could do a product over sum is equal to F. That's another way of writing that. Because if you were to combine this with the common denominator, SO, SI, then you would have, you know, SI plus SO up there, or just flip it. So that's kind of a cool way to remember this product over sum. It works for when you have two things you're adding like this. I remember that trick when I was using resistors, adding resistors in parallel or something, but it only works for two. Don't, don't try it if there's three. Okay, so that means SOSI is FSO plus FSI, and the SI is going to be SO minus F equals F. So, so we have this equation. So that's the one we want. What are so many of these things? So when you put that in here, that's going to get, oh man, I got to put it also in there. Oh. But this is Algebra City, and this is what we do, just like a meticulous experiment. We can require hours to adjust things just right to take data. Algebra City can take time. So let's uh, go ahead and write that down. Again, we get this minus F, and we put this in. We put this in at the top, and then we're gonna put it in on the bottom, in the right place. This is FC times C. F times D minus, and here's another one, just the same thing, F, S, O, S, O minus F, and then there's a D hanging around, all right? Okay, we've seen something like that before when we were looking at lenses and stuff, you know, the complications like that, and we were doing thick lenses. Well, the best thing to do here, first thing to do here is notice that See if I can do this gently. Uh, this F cancels an F here, cancels an F there, cancels an F there. So an F, an F goes away everywhere. So let's see if we can make that happen with also multiplying by the denominator S O minus F. So if we do that, all right, then we're gonna get here a minus sign out front. And in the numerator, we'll have three things. This F will have an S, O, and a D. Then down in the denominator, we'll have the S, O, minus F, multiplying here a C and a D. So there's a C plus D. And then we'll subtract the S O times D. And there's more algebra to be done. So if we do that, more algebra, three things on top, we have S O C plus S O D minus F C 
minus FD minus SOD and sometimes things go our way. And what I'm saying here is that this and this, that, that I like that. You know, S canceled and now this, this gets, you know, subtracted, uh, canceled out. That's very nice, all right? So therefore this is minus this over S O C minus F C minus F D. And let's uh, go ahead and bring that minus sign in. So we lose it in the numerator and then we flip and in here we go minus S O C plus F C plus F D. All right, so the formula that we have is then, this is the final version, and we're gonna have here put the FD first, and then let's subtract Let's see if this works. So the FD is here, minus C, S, O, and then two minus signs cancel, I have the FC. See, that's very elegant formula. That's in terms of F, that's in terms of the object distance, in terms of D, and C, this is beautiful. So now we wanna do the same thing over again, and this is kind of like a nice review of what we did, because we're gonna do it now for the near the near case, all right, same thing. So we have to find a triangle like we did over here, and then we're going to go through the same steps. And as I say, you can skip over this if you if you like um, to you know work it out on your own, as as would probably be done like or look at look at the book. All the steps are in a book, but let's go ahead and do it. And here, if we look at say uh, this lens here. And say this is D over uh, two. And I'm gonna go on this one. I'm gonna, I don't wanna mess up that diagram there. So this little C thing, I wanna draw a little rectangle here. So that if we were to look at this, say, uh, this is the, the red line we're doing now. So say if we come down like this, it's gonna hit the top of there. Uh, basically draw, pulling out, you know, this little green thing here. This is a C over two. And I'm looking at this, you know, big triangle. So this, this here is a D over two minus a C over two because C over two is your height. See, that's your C over two. D over two is the whole thing. That's C over two, I gotta subtract that. And then I'm gonna play around with this uh, triangle, bigger one and a smaller one, and set up some nice little relationships. So now this is the image, this is the image uh, distance for the near, all right? That, that means the object is near on the, on the left side, but then here it's gonna be, you know, more to the right. So here, if we look at uh, D over two, minus D over two, here we'll do like a tangent thing. We'll set up the ratio a little differently. So we have this thing over this distance. And this distance here, if you recall to, to the green thing, that is, if you're going to that green thing, that's gonna be your, your SI. In other words, if you're, if you're focused, yeah, here it is, the green thing, see? It's this SI. So that means this is SI, all right? So that's over SI. And then this one here, C over two, we're gonna divide that by this length, which 
is which is the SIN minus the SI. Okay, so looking at this, uh, we can see that we can see we have D minus C over SI is C. Multiply both sides by two is what we're doing here. Okay, so this is SI near minus SI times D minus C equals C times SI. And we do some algebra here. All right. SIN times D minus SIN times C minus SID plus SIC. And that equals CSI. So then here, we can write down SIND minus SINC minus SID is zero because see this one here is gonna cancel that. Since we had the CSI on both sides of the equation, this is nice. So then the SIN D minus C is SID, and that means the SIN is SID over D minus C. And that's analogous uh, to the equation we had earlier. Notice uh, it's kind of neat that there's a difference here instead of the, uh, the sum, the D and the C. Okay, and then what we do, what did we do next? Well, what did we do next is we went to this equation with the, uh, the general equation here, and we substituted. So we're doing the same thing over here. If we look at the map, we're going to you know, do the exact, this goes in here, just like that one went in there. So it's basically the same steps that we just did, but kind of is reinforced, you know, I think it's good to kind of go through it. I'm gonna do it for you here. So if we do that, then we get a one over S object near plus one over, then this goes in. So we're going to uh, put that in. Why don't we just go ahead and flip that while we're at it? D minus C over S I D and that's uh, one over F. So we went ahead and one over S I N, we went ahead and flipped that, saved ourselves a step. And then the next step we did is we found the common denominator. Okay, so this would be S I D cancels and you get the one over S O near. And then here I wanna cancel the S O near, so D minus C, it's whatever F. So the, this cancels and you would have the correct answer there. So let's uh, go ahead and do what we did before. We're gonna multiply by the F on the left side, the top S I D plus F S O N D minus C, and then bring this denominator to the right hand side. Okay, so the F hit the S I D, the F hit the S O N D minus C, and then the S O N S I D came to the right hand side. And then what we did next, just following along, we are going to solve, see, this SOF, see? So, S, we're looking for the SON, so let's get the SONs on one side of the equation. Okay, there's an SON there. And if we subtract the SID, And then we're gonna bring this on the other side of the equation. So we brought this one 
to the other side of the equation. We then brought this to the left side. So this one is here, minus S-O-N, S-I-D, that's here. And this one is just copied down where we took the S-O-N out. So if we look at that, uh, then we're, we can solve for the uh, S on just like we did up here for the SOF that's what we're trying to do but remember this is going to be a nasty step uh, remember that nasty step that we have to we have to deal with that's coming up so this is equal to uh, say minus sign the F S I D over all this stuff the F D minus C minus SID and now comes that part where we we don't like this we don't want this man we gotta get rid of that we went in terms of the SO but here we're going to use the same equation we already figured out this say so this is going to go into two places we already have that so let's let's do that SON is minus F, and now we put the big mess in at the top, times D. Then for the, the denominator, D minus C minus, and then the big mess, and that's gonna times D. Okay, now that we have that, what we did before, it's like, this is the, a nice review because see the F's cancel. And then what we did is you multiply top and bottom by S O minus F. So S O N is minus, now you have the three things here. And uh, that's kind of nice because it, yeah, it looks like the same there, it's nice. And then we divide here, S O minus F, D minus C, minus S O D. And we just expect a cancellation in that denominator. So this is uh, say minus F, S O D. I'll work this out, S O D minus SOC minus FD plus FC minus SOD. So SOD is here. SOC has the minus sign from here. And then minus FD, and then the two minus signs cancel at the plus sign, just this last one just written down. And here, let's see, did we get lucky again? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, this here canceled there. That's nice. And then we write down SON. We're gonna have the same numerator, F, S, O, D. And now here a minus sign is gonna go in. And when that minus sign goes in, let's see what happens. Uh, this, this will become a plus. So this is F, D. So they got got this one taken care of. And when the minus sign goes in, uh, then this will become a plus. So I'm gonna go plus, factor out the C, S, and then this is minus F. So when the minus sign goes in, you get a plus S, O, C. There's the plus S, O, C. The minus sign goes in, you get a plus F, D. There's the plus F, D. The minus sign goes in, you get a minus FC, and there's the C, the F with the minus sign. That's it. Where are we finished? <laughs> Almost, we have to subtract. We have to subtract them now. No, no, we gotta subtract them now. Yes, we gotta subtract these two together. All right. So let's, let's do it. Okay, here's what we have to subtract. Now notice that the right-hand side, everything's in nice. We got the focal length, we got the aperture opening, we got the circle confusion, and we got where we're focusing on, the uh, 
the object subject distance and then uh, this would be as far away you can get to be in tolerable focus and this is in as near as you can get in the depth of field which we'll write down like this by definition take the far one and subtract the uh, the near one so we subtract these two together so the depth of focus excuse me depth of field depth of field is then you know since this is in in both of these i'm going to divide by the f sod so i don't have to run down so and so much okay so here then i have this all right minus this Right. It's kind of nice how these are like similar. So, you know, this would be here and would be there, but I, I don't want to write them down that often. So I'm going to just work with these things first and I'll put, then I'll move it back over. Now this is very nice. This is FD squared. When you put these together for your common denominator minus S squared. So I uh, see like this. So then we're going to have this one up on the left. And then we're going to subtract this one. So what we did here is we shoved these two things together. If you shove these two things together in the denominator, then you need to have this first so that when it cancels, you get one over the left one, and you subtract, then you have uh, uh, this one up there, so it would, would, track, it would subtract. So basically, we're doing like one over, say we have bracket, say A minus, you know, one over bracket B, then you're gonna have bracket A, bracket B, you want bracket B minus bracket A, so the B's cancel, you get the one over the bracket A minus the A's cancel over bracket B. It's just so happens to be when you multiply bracket A and bracket B together, you get this difference of squares. That's nice. And there's more bonus. It looks like here, this canceled here. Okay. And here I did made one thing. I forgot my brackets. This should put a bracket here and we should have a bracket there. So those still cancel, but then the other ones uh, double up. Okay, so the other ones double up. So you get here a two C S O F okay, divided by the F D squared minus c squared. Okay, so it's not so bad, we're almost finished now. And now we can put this back up. So if we put that back up, the depth of field, if we put that back up there, we're gonna have then a two, here's the two, and then there's the f, s, o, D, and there's a C, and then there's this difference, and that's divided by F, D squared minus C squared. Now this is advanced photography, mathematics, the science of photography. There's the depth of, there's your depth of field. Beautiful equation. You know, when in doubt, you could always use this master formula. But typically, your object distance where you focus is going to be a lot bigger than the focal length. In fact, it's going to be something like maybe 10 meters. We're going to see in the next section on the hyperfocal length that this is the place where you would focus and everything to infinity would be acceptable. So, you know, 10 meters... But C is super small. That's on that film, that's very, very small. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to, we factored out the S-O, 
So compared to the focal length of 50 like millimeters, compared to like 10 meters, we're going to throw that away. And then the C being super small, we're going to throw the C, we're going to throw this, this part away. So then we're left with the 2FSO squared DC over the FD quantity squared. And then if you uh, look at this and FD cancels, so you have 2S O squared C over 1 FD. And then if you put the D as F number, then this would be F squared over the number which flips back up top. And this is a formula you often find used as an approximate formula. But, you know, one in down, as I say, just go ahead and use the master formula. All right, so then the last thing would be the hyperfocal length. And for the hyperfocal length, what we do is we want, we want to pick a distance we can focus on so that all the way to infinity, we're good to go. So the far, the far one is in tolerable focus also. So let's look at this formula. If this uh, far one's gonna to go to infinity, that means the denominator has to be zero. So FD is going to equal C, and then when you have that magic distance, it's called a hyperfocal length, S O is H. And this gets you FD is CH minus CF, and that gets you F D plus CF is CH, and that gets you H is F plus FD over C. And since that C is very, very small. When you divide by a small quantity, you're gonna get here, that's your dominant term. And here, if D is F divided by the number, then this is gonna be F squared over C times the number. Now watch this cool thing. The near point where you can still B in focus is given by this formula that we have already seen. Just copying it down again from the top here. Then when you put in uh, here, uh, let's go, we'll go ahead and put in, we'll use this formula here. We're gonna put in there. This is FD over C, D. And then this is FD plus C, FD over C. Right. Then here, what you find happening is uh, here we could uh, write this as F squared D squared over C up there. And then here where we got, we got FD plus FD minus CF. This is very, very small. So we basically have this 1 over 2 FD hitting this. And that means you'll drop an FD down in power there over 2 uh, C. But the FD over C is the H. This is cool. It's like half, half the hyperfocal distance. That is wild. So that means that if you want to take a picture of some landscape very, very far away, and say here's your camera over here, that you find this magic place to focus on, the hyperfocal distance. All this is in focus. And also, you're in focus to half of this uh, distance. So this is the uh, depth of field wild. It goes from infinity to half that H. That's a very, very profound calculation and discovery in photography. Okay, so we did a lot of stuff here. You're all photography experts.